we're thinking um, this week about those things that remain in a world of turmoil, in a world of trouble, in a world of challenges, in, a, in our, each of our own worlds. I suspect each of us lives in our own world and, and we all face various um, trials and tribulations as well as joys and, and delights. Um, but we, we are knocked around and there seems to be an awful lot of knocking around at the moment when we hear the news and read the papers. Um, there just seems to be challenges from every angle, from every corner. So as um, we were thinking about uh, what we might share during the course of this week, we, um, we thought we would think about those things that remain forever, those things that are, that are anchor-like, those things that, that stand firm, that stand fast. So from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, a verse we all know very, very well. And now these three remain. These three are forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So I'm thinking a bit about faith this morning. And... Um, I wonder what's the first thing you think of when you think of the word faith. Anyway, it's probably very different to what I'm thinking. <laughs> the famous passage of St. Augustine, in, uh, written in his Confessions, in which he states, You, God, have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. We can all resonate with this, can't we? There is, there is a longing inside each of us for peace. There is a longing inside each of us for, for a restlessness, for, for a rest, a calm. A, um, a, if, if only thing was, everything was just fine all the time. And I think, I think we long for that, don't we? And, and, and there are loads of quick fix jobs out there. The world offers so many different things for us as to how we might find that peace and that serenity, a lovely cruise to the Caribbean. Wouldn't that be great? The uh, I'm in, anybody else in? <laughs> but just those, uh, those escape opportunities, those things that are offered to us by the world. Maybe it's, um, um, I don't know what, it, what you might be offered, but you know, we hear of retail therapy and things like that. And it's the, the advertising world in this, um, in this country is worth billions of pounds every year. It's, it's extraordinary. The attention that the world is trying to get to us to give us some rest, to give us some... Um, you're worth it. You are worth it. Um, and, and we long for those things, don't we? Um, but the rest that the Lord gives is different, isn't it? The serenity, the security, the contentment, the peace that the Lord gives is different. And he wants us to experience that. He wants us to have that. His desire for the people of Israel was that they would enter into his promised rest. Did the people of Israel enter into the promised rest? No, we know they didn't. And as I was thinking about it um, a few weeks ago, um, I, I happened along Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, um, and it's a very stark reminder of why they didn't enter into the promised rest. And it, and it boils down to one word. Unbelief. It's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a shaker, isn't it? The people of Israel didn't enter into what was promised them because they didn't believe. Um, and I've been challenged by this as I've thought about it over these past weeks. What does it mean then not to believe? What does it mean, what did it mean for the people of Israel? And what might it mean for us? I think the people of Israel suffered with the age old disease of what I'm calling my way sclerosis. My way sclerosis. We all know sclerosis is a hardening of tissue or, or part of the body. My way sclerosis, the hardening of our hearts, the hardening of who we are resisting him. And the people of Israel suffered from that, and they were accused of that by the prophets um, and by St. Stephen, as we know in the New Testament. You've stiffened your neck and hardened your hearts. 
you have not listened to the Lord. And what were they trying to do? They, were, they lived in the tension of trying to live with God on their terms, not on his terms. Trying to live with God on their terms, whereas they knew, and Holy Scripture teaches us, that we cannot. We can only live with God on his terms. And there is something about how we are to believe him. What, what would that look like then if I was to believe him fully, to be able to trust him enough not to allow this my way sclerosis um, to have its way in my life? Well, acting and walking and living by faith means that, one, we're shaped by the Word of God. Two, we do the Word of God in the power of God. And three, we aim in doing these things to the glory of God. So it's about the Word of God and the power of God and the glory of God. And walking by faith is what these things mean. And when, I was on, when we were on sabbatical last year, the, the, probably the single biggest lesson I learned, which surprises me again and again and again, surprises people when I tell them, was that I wasn't trusting God. I was suffering from trying to get it done my way and not trying to get things done His way. And when we try and get things done our way, what happened to me was, and I don't know if this is an experience you may have, it leads to exhaustion because we're doing it in our own strength. When we do it in His way, with His power, there's more chance of, there's more chance of that eternal youth um, that we can experience, that we can enjoy because He enables us to do the things that He wants us to do. And when we do the things that we want to do in the strength that we want to do, that the, in the strength that we have, I find that that just leads to exhaustion. The, um, another way of looking at it is, is with the verse that I began with, was, you know, what do we yoke ourselves with? Well, I found when I was on sabbatical that I had yoked myself with the expectation of the people of, of, of the center. Um, and uh, and I... I I say that because it's, it's just a fact. I don't say that to, to diss anybody or to... I, I say it to own up because I've learned a lesson and I want to share that lesson with, with others. The expectations of what was required of me here at the center was a yoke I placed on myself. So I must get this right for the people. Did you hear what I said? I must get this right for the people. I must get this right. What was God asking me to do? And if I was wearing His yoke, would have it have been a different experience? Well, I discovered in the weeks of, in the first few weeks of the retreat, I was, I was taking off yoke after yoke. I don't want to rub this in because there are too many yokes to mention. The, but I was taking off all of these things that I had labored myself with. I know how we can get money to make this work. I know how to do that. He has another way of doing that. And if I seek His face and seek His instruction, seek His guidance, then I can learn from Him and He will do what He wants to do. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. I've been thinking a lot about holiness recently. Um, I know it doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, um, but, I, but I discovered after, uh, after a few weeks of thinking about holiness and reading into holiness that I was beginning to weigh myself down with it. Why? Because I was trying to imitate holiness. I had made it my own thing. I can be holy, they'll see. <laughs> I had to put on a robe eventually to try and make it look good. <laughs> I tried to imitate holiness rather than allow the impartation of holiness which comes from Him. Yahweh Mkadesh, I am the Lord who makes you holy. It's a gift from Him. But I labored myself with it. And why do we do that sometimes? Why do we labor ourselves with the things that we want to get right for Him? And hey, 
That's an honorable thing. But he says, come to me and do it my way. And you will have rest for your souls. And I would like that. Would you like that? We all would, wouldn't we? Freedom comes when we take off the yokes that have been placed on us by... Who's placed yokes on you? The people of Israel were freed from the, the yoke of the Egyptians. Who's placed yokes on you? The expectations of the nation? The expectations of family? The expectations of your neighbor? The expectations of our churches? Whose yokes are we bearing? When Jesus says, come to me and wear my yoke, for my yoke is light, my, my burden is light, my, my yoke is easy, and you will find rest for your souls. And in the context of faith, this is huge, because it's making a choice to believe that he will do what he said he will do. He will show us the way, and then he will give us the strength so that we may do what he wants us to do, so that he may be glorified. So the people will say, see and say, these people have been hanging out with that Jesus guy, which is what they said of the New Testament church. And that's what made the difference. Surrendering my way sclerosis, surrendering the way I want to do things my way to him, so that I may take his way, it's a, big, it's a big ask, isn't it? Because our default position is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this right. So I just put it out there for us to think about during the course of the day, if you like, about how, how am I trusting him? Am I trusting him completely? Or are there things that I do that, that I do? And I do them in my power, in my strength. Or is my life so completely, and I've got a long way to go to get anywhere near this, or is my life so completely, single-mindedly focused on God and on God's ways for me and receiving His energy, His strength, His power so that I may glorify Him? That's how I would like to be. Um, but I, I'm learning to stop trying to do it myself and trusting him to do it for me. Because that's the way it works. There is something about the need for surrender. And I know the, when I woke up this morning, I, I love the Lord. I mean, we've been thinking about this theme for a, for a while now. Um, but he waits until the last morning. <laughs> he waits until the last morning. And the word that came to me was surrender. That's faith. Not my way. His way. I believe him. So, I'm going to tell you um, a story of a guy you've probably never heard of. Now, you're all going to prove me wrong. Uh, one of my favorite Old Testament characters, his name is Barzillai. Anybody heard of Barzillai? No, see, you are all so kind. <laughs> This is how he's doing Barzillai again. <laughs> 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 31 to 35. Barzillai the Gileadite also came down from Rogalim to cross the Jordan, the Jordan with the king and to send him on his way from there. Now, Barzillai was a very old man. I wonder why I chose this passage. Now, <laughs> sorry. Now, Barzillai was a very old man. He was only 80 years of age. <laughs> 80 years of age. He had provided for the king during his stay in Manaheim, for he was a very wealthy man. The king said to Barzillai, cross over with me and stay with me in Jerusalem, and I will provide for you. There's an invitation, hey? The king, come with me, and you'll have everything you want. But Barzillai answered the king, how many more years will I live? that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I am now an old codger. I am now 80 years old. Can I tell the difference between what is good and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats and drinks? 
Can I still hear the voices of men and women singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to my Lord the King? Surrender. I don't want to come and live with the king. The expectations will be too great for me to live. I will need to say, doesn't this taste wonderful when my taste buds are shot? I will need to say, this music is fantastic when there's actually nothing being played because you can't hear anymore. I don't want to live like that. I just want to go home. I just want to be me. I just want to be Barzillai. I think there's something about surrender in there, isn't it? Isn't there? Having the courage to say, okay, Lord. I'm handing it all over to you now. Is a courage that is a gift from him. And he is the one who does the work. Just look at these t- couple of verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day the God-shaped work that is going on inside of you, who's renewing you inwardly day by day? Who's doing that work? Are you? Are you? You can't. It's a work that he does. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Who makes us holy? God. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. It's so easy, isn't it? (laughs) And I get it wrong day after day after day. I'm going to ask Esther to put up a prayer, prayer of Charles de Foucault on the screen and just give you a moment to read it. And if you'd like to say that prayer with me now, as an act of faith, please do. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence because you are my Father, and because I know, Father, that you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And if nothing else happens this morning, know that you are loved passionately to the point of death. He loves us so much that he gives up himself so that we may be his. The invitation is, come to me 
and I will give you rest. Come to Jesus and he will give you rest.